biggest boss and I've been in trillis. I'm a bigger problem when I click with Skrillex. Murder on my mind, it's time to pray to God. My revolver's not religious, the revolution's born. You want to know my name, to go and tell us all. You want to know my gang, suicide squad. Pistol on my waist, I might make a mistake. A show of pro ones saying, every day is a winding road, especially if you suffer from chronic vertigo. Welcome to Film Bookcast, the official wow. podcast of filmbook.com. My name is Mike Smith, and joining me as always is a man with the word damage tattooed to his forehead. Mike the Joker Decretion. Yep. That's him. Why <laughs> did you get that t- uh, forehead tattoo, Mike? Um, because I was an edgy 16-year-old, and I wanted everyone to know. <laughs> but you're basically unemployable now, right? Uh, yeah, I live a life of crime. Okay. All right. I so, mean, like, I'm doing all right. It's a decent living? Yeah. yeah well, that's, that's, that's That's good. As long as you can make time to host the film <laughs> book cast. That's all we I'll, ask of you. I'll never be too damaged for you, Mike. <laughs> Uh, that's good, that's good. If you've never listened to a film book cast before, first we start with some film news and then we move on to some discussions where Mike and I each discuss whatever media we've been consuming lately, and then after that, we will move on to our featured review. This week we are reviewing the new film from director David Ayer and the third film in the DC Extended Universe, Suicide Squad. Are you ready for this, Mike? I am. I'm very excited for uh, what we'll probably say. Yeah, yeah. And uh, this this review is coming out a little bit late. We wanted to get this out like two weeks ago when the movie came out, but... Yeah, computer problems abounded, and uh, here we are. Uh, but still, I think I think the extra time will have given us more things to complain about. Yeah, uh, <laughs> we just had more time to stew. Yes, basically. exactly. So this should be a very good review. But before we get into the review, let's get into some film news. Hi, it's time for. Hi, it's time for. Right, it's time for film news, and like we said, this website is coming out a couple weeks late, so this, some of this news is a little bit older, but uh, the first thing we wanted to talk about, there is a sequel to Joe Johnston's The Rocketeer in the works. <laughs> that that alone, I don't, like, is that a thing that needed? It was needed? Like, was there much <laughs> clamor over how The Rocketeer ended that we needed a second one? All right, like, am I to guess that you're not a fan of The Rocketeer, Mike? Is that what I'm hearing? I mean, my memories of the Rocketeer is borrowing it from the library when I was like nine, okay. and being like, "This is really cool. He's flying with jetpack," and <laughs> like that's all I remember. Okay, I have very hazy memories of the Rocketeer as well. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Is, I, this a, is this a movie that like is ingrained in like our culture that we need a second one? That it's like people... kind of considered a cult classic. Uh, it, it didn't make a huge impact uh, at the box office or anything when it came out, but I feel like over time, it's grown something of a small audience uh and it's actually the movie that got joe johnson the job to direct uh, the first captain america film captain america the first avenger uh okay it has a very similar kind of vibe to it you know throwback nostalgic kind of these this is how movies used to be kind of vibe right uh, yeah you know <laughs> uh and so the fact that they're doing a sequel to the rocketeer uh, the rocketeer called the rocketeers which implies multiple rocketeers it uh, does <laughs> uh is a little odd but i think there is something of an audience there, and if they can market it well, I think it can really fit in in the big superhero boom. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I didn't think, I didn't consider that. It was just seemed like an odd movie for them to reach back into the... I mean, not even that far, but, like, reach back into how movies that have been made and pick the Rocketeer, the one that we need to make a second <laughs> one of. Right. Well, the, the thesis, the plan with this movie is that a black woman will be taking up the mantle of the Rocketeer six years after the original movie came out. And the movie, or six years after the movie takes place, I should say. Right. And the movie takes place, I think, in the 40s? Yeah, 40s or 50s. I don't yeah. really remember. So this is only six years later. So it's going to be a very interesting take on the Rocketeer, because black women, the black people in general, during that time period, were kind, right. of, were kind of downtrodden. Kind of? <laughs> oh, that seems like a pretty loose... A loose definition of the word kind of. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I th- so I think that's kind of cool to have like this black woman go in this huge like superhero position of power almost right uh, in that time period. That's a cool concept, and it's kind of reminiscent of uh, Marvel's recent announcement of a black woman taking over the role of Iron Man in the comics. It's happening uh, pretty soon, I think, if, if it hasn't happened already. Uh, right. So yeah, 
it's it's definitely it could be a really cool opportunity. Uh, I'm sure we'll we'll have to wait for you know more announcements about casting and directing and all that stuff. Uh, yeah, it just seems like an odd choice for me. Yeah, I'll be <laughs> I'll, I'll be interested to see if director Joe Johnston comes back for this because uh, I know I mean he did Captain America and it seemed like you know he that was a big hit for him and I felt like he was going to do more stuff but he hasn't really done anything since he did like a directed video uh, like thriller that didn't get good reviews a couple years ago. Uh, oh, oh, how the mighty have fallen. Apparently, yeah. <laughs> uh, so it'd be cool if they can get him back to this, because I do like his sensibility. Uh, you know, other films that he's directed included Jurassic Park 3. Uh, the best Jurassic Park, <laughs> said no one. Uh, what else did he do? I think he did The Wolfman, uh, right before, like the 2010 The Wolfman. With oh, like the Missy Yeah. Yeah, that was him. Uh, so he's, he's got some misses in there. Uh, yeah. But I feel like, like he's generally at his best when he's kind of in this kind of, in this kind of zone, doing the Rockets here, doing Captain America. Uh, yeah, you know. it, it it would be a missed opportunity though to not uh, give it to a female director or especially a African American female director. That's true too. That's true too. So we'll, we'll see. If, if you're gonna do the Rockets, if you're gonna do this and make it like a whole thing about the black woman taking over that Rocketeer mantle, why not go all the way? Right, and have a black woman directing your blockbuster. Yeah. Speaking of that, you know, uh, this is, uh, you definitely helped out with this segue, Mike. Uh, <laughs> Captain Segway strikes again. Boom. Uh, Ava DuVernay, who is the director of Selma with uh, David Oyelowo about the Martin Luther King uh, Selma uh, walk, uh, is going to be the first woman of color to direct a $100 million film, uh, a movie with a budget above $100 million. And that movie is A Wrinkle in Time. Uh, and she's been working on this movie for a little while. It just kind of recently came out. The budget will be over $100 million. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that makes her the first woman of color to direct one. Also, only the third woman overall. Uh, after Catherine Bigelow, who directed K-19, The Widowmaker, back in 2002. Uh, <laughs> your chuckle of disapproval over there. Is... Yeah, I just can't, like, I, when you told me we were going to, that's part of this. Uh, I just can't believe that movie is yeah. still the thing we have to talk about. The ever. first female-directed $100 million film. Was K nineteen the Widowmaker, and it set back female directors probably twenty years. <laughs> I know you make that joke, but like I'm sure there were Hollywood executives that used that reason. I know, yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, and the other the other woman is Patty Jenkins, who uh, whose movie has not even been released yet, uh, but that is Wonder Woman, uh, which is coming out next year. Right. Uh, so I think that's very cool that Ava DuVernay is going to be the first woman of color. Uh, she's a great director. Salma was awesome. Uh, yeah, very good movie, and uh, but it's it's kind of fucked up that there's only been three <laughs> female directors who directed big blockbuster movies that are over a hundred million dollars. Yeah, for all of uh, for all of Hollywood's uh, you know lefty communist uh, liberal stuff that they pretend they are, they're like such assholes. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's great. Hopefully, Wrinkle in Time is an amazing book. Uh, hopefully, they turn it into an amazing movie, and I'm sure they will. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, so. I, I read A Wrinkle in Time in like seventh grade, and I haven't read. I, I don't remember really much about it. Uh, I remember it being cool. Yeah, uh, I remember. I had the same thing where I, I read Wrinkle in Time in seventh grade. I or whatever you know in middle school. Uh, I remember really liking it, and then I don't remember where I got like a somehow. I think like a, you know a friend moved away or something like that. So I got a giant like huge box of books from them. Okay. And in there was a box set of the four novels that are the Wrinkle in Time, like, series. Right. So I read through all of those, and they're really cool. It's like, the, you know, it's the weird time travel sci-fi and kind of introduced me to all that stuff. So I really like it. Okay. So, cool. So hopefully they make a really awesome movie out of it. Hopefully, hopefully. Uh, and in other news, uh, Luke Besson, director of The Fifth Element, and uh, recently, I think recently he directed Lucy. He's got a new movie coming out this year called Valerian and the City of Something. Uh, I don't remember the exact title. Valerian. Some, some sci-fi bullshit. So, yeah, some, something insane. He's, <laughs> I really like Luke Besson. He also directed uh, The Professional, actually. Uh, I, I really like Luke Besson. I think he's a totally nuts filmmaker. Like, at his best, he just does totally bonkers stuff, and it's usually pretty entertaining. Yeah. Uh, he produces a lot of movies, and one of the movies he produced was the movie Lockout with Guy Pearce a few years ago, or as I affectionately call it, Space Jail. Uh, <laughs> uh, have you seen Lockout, Mike? Uh, I think I started to, and I think there's a car chase in like the first 10 or 15 minutes, and I gave up after that because it was clearly <laughs> like Guy Pearce on a green screen. And I was just like, it's looks like, and none of it looked good. <laughs> okay, I uh, I saw Lockout in the theater, and I gotta tell you, I enjoyed it uh, when okay. I saw it. When I saw it, 
uh, I have not watched it since. And I and actually, uh, it's funny because I remember uh, Dan Harmon was tweeting about Lockout a couple of years ago. Like he happened to watch it, and he yeah. really liked it too. And then just recently, the other day, he actually tweeted about it again, <laughs> uh, and said like some and was tweeting about Lockout and said like, yeah, I haven't watched it since that time I watched it and gave it a rated review, and I don't want to watch it again. Because I don't want to live in a world where lockout isn't perfect. <laughs> <laughs> That's because, amazing. And I kind of feel the same way. Like, I feel like if I watch it again, I might not like it as much. But, like, because people keep saying it's bad. It's bad. Yeah. Uh, but but it's a, it was a really fun time. I think Guy Pierce is uh, just really fun in that movie. And uh, But the thing is, lockout uh, was apparently deemed too similar to Escape from New York the John Carpenter film, and there was actually a lawsuit about it, and Luke Besson was found guilty of plagiarizing John Carpenter and has to pay half a million dollars uh, because of it. That's crazy. Yeah, and it's I think that's super weird, because A, I feel Lockout takes a lot more from Taken than anything else. You know, it's just, right. it's just Taken right. in space. And ta- ta- <laughs> it's just Taken in space. <laughs> that's how they pitch that movie. It, it has is to, how they pitch that movie. It it's has to be. be. Uh, and Luke Besson actually produced Taken, so there's no problem there. Uh, right. Uh, and it's not like it's the only movie to rip off Escape from New York if there is a ripoff there. And I, there's definitely similarities, but it's not like it's the only movie to rip off Escape from New York. Hence, Suicide Squad, the movie we're talking about today, right. is about criminals with a chip in their head that will kill them if they don't do what the government says. And what the government's saying them to do is to go into this abandoned city to retrieve this uh, missing person. <laughs> this government <laughs> official, in fact. Like, yeah. You're very, you're very right. It's literally the plot of Escape from New York. <laughs> Why? Why are we suing Lockout? When <laughs> Suicide Squad is playing in theaters right now. Yeah, I love that. Of all movies for them to hang their hat on, they picked Lockout <laughs> of the movie. This is where we draw the line. <laughs> so, yeah. So Bizarre. there's that. I do think that's it's kind of ridiculous. Uh, like, sorry, Luke Besson, that you have to pay five hundred thousand dollars. Like, I'm sure he can afford it. Yeah. Because uh, he's made a bunch of successful movies and. You know, he's made a lot, he's based a lot of cool movies. Uh, I'm, I heard uh, pretty wild things. He went to Comic Con this year with his new movie, and again, it's called Valerian and the something. I don't okay. remember, <laughs> like the city on the clouds, or like the city in space, or like the, the Valerian. Take it in, Valerian and the Take It in Space. <laughs> Valerian and the Take It in Space. Valerian and the Tegan and Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. Come for the movie reviews, stay for the jokes. Stay for our hilarious riffs. Uh, yes. <laughs> but anyway, I enjoyed Lockout. I do, I do think <laughs> <laughs> So, sorry, Lockout. Uh, uh. You know, it's, ar- it's arguable that Lockout might even be a better film than Escape from New York. Whoa. I, w- I won't. I'm not going to go there, but I'm going to say it's arguable. And I'm going to leave right. it at that. All right. Uh, <laughs> I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna say, Escape from New York isn't uh, one of my favorite John Carpenter films. It's fine, but like <laughs> it's like good and all. But yeah. Uh, that said, we do we do have one last bit of film news left, and this isn't really film news; it's a rumor. And I usually don't report rumors. We usually don't talk about them on on the podcast because they change so frequently. And yeah. you know, it's, it's something that could be a rumor one week could like could end up being nothing. Like it's yeah, you know, easily a lot. Most rumors are shot down. This one is so weird. And so bizarre, I felt like I had to mention it at least once. Uh, Brad Pitt is apparently courting David Fincher to direct the... For War- Shrek 5. <laughs> <laughs> you son of a bitch. Uh, <laughs> it's never going to go away. <laughs> David Fincher's Shrek 5 starring Brad Pitt is, <laughs> is what it is. is the, that's what this rumor is. It's we had no choice but to talk shit. about <laughs> Uh, apparently, he's according to David Fincher to direct the sequel to World War Z, the World War Zequel, if you will. Uh, All right. If I'm allowed to make Shrek Five jokes, you can make that joke. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I'm glad we've reached compromise. Yeah. Uh, uh, this is bizarre because a, I mean, we we both saw World War Z. I'm guessing, right? Yeah. Okay. What are your feelings on World War Z? Uh, I honestly don't really remember a whole lot, other than that I thought the ending was really stupid. Uh, <laughs> That's- that's the um, only, like, thought I have left of that movie. I, I remember a couple things. I remember that there was a wall of zombies at one point. Yeah. Uh, I remember the ending was, like, very out, at odds with the rest of the movie. Because the rest of the movie is, like, this big globetrotting adventure. And then, like, the last half hour is, like, this 
like enclosed space kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, and then I remember it ends on a freeze frame. I thought that was bullshit. Uh, <laughs> You're right, it does. I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah, I, think, I, I remember made clear reading though, my feelings on freeze frames. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, I remember reading a lot of stuff too that they had to reshoot the whole last third of the movie. They did. Because yeah. I, was it in, they were supposed to be India or Russia? I don't remember where they were supposed to be, but then... Like, the ending, some, the ending wasn't working, and so they had ended up bringing in other writers. Like, I think Drew Goddard rewrote the last third yeah. or something. And I think Damon Lindelof came on, too. Uh, there's a lot of people who worked on that movie. Uh, and the thing is, I don't think it was outright bad. I just think it's kind of forgettable. But they made a lot of money, and so the studios are like, well, you know, it is a recognizable brand. And the book is, was very popular at the time. Yeah. I remember World War Z was, like, a hugely popular book for a couple of years. I think I think if that's kind of died down though. I don't think, I don't hear anybody talking about World War Z anymore. Yeah, I think that the I mean it, it was part of that whole Walking Dead, uh, you know, Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, which I think was a movie that just came out. Yes. That book came out. Whereas I think it's also written by the guy who wrote World War Z. Um, I, don't, I don't think so. I think uh, Pride and Prejudice, Pride and Prejudice, and Zombies. Oh no, was, uh, it, Seth Graham Smith. Yeah, it was right. uh, the Va- Abraham Lincoln. Vampire that was, that was also that was also Seth Graham Smith. Yeah, that's uh, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Uh, but there was that that huge upswell of zombie stuff. Yeah, no, World War Z the book is, was written by Max Brooks, who was the son of Mel Brooks. Right, that's what it was. And but there was that, and uh, you know, that whole upswell in zombie stuff in pop culture, and those all kind of came out all at once. Yeah, yeah, and World War Z was a big part. Like, and I remember that when the movie came out, people were very critical about it because it didn't really do it. It it was not the book at all. <laughs> from what yeah. I understand. Yeah, from what I've heard, I haven't read the book. Uh, Neither but I. That it's supposed to be a UN uh, advisor or somebody after World War Z, yeah, getting, and he's collecting history reports on the various zombie things. So each chapter is kind of like a different story in this zombie world or something. Yeah, uh, so it could have sounds been, awesome. So yeah. I wanted, I kind of want to read it. A straight adaptation of that as like an HBO miniseries or something, <laughs> like that could be cool. Yeah, uh, but uh, you know, the World War Z kind of just became like this action movie with zombies in it. Right. Uh, and now they're trying to make a sequel, which I think is very odd considering, especially this year, there's been a lot of sequels to movies that people were very ambivalent about, and those sequels have been failing at the box office, like left and right. You look at yeah. like Alice, in Wonderland, uh, or Alice in Wonderland 2 through the Looking Glass, you look at uh, Now You See Me 2. Oh, the Huntsman one. Oh, Huntsman. Huntsman Winter's War, yeah. There's, you know, like, nobody was clamoring for a sequel to Snow White and the Huntsman, right? No. Like, <laughs> no. Especially nope. one without Snow White. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, and I feel like I feel like a World War Z equal would be on the same kind of wavelength. You know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> but like we were talking about before, they're just picking movies to make sequels about. I guess pretty much. Like if it, if it made money, and uh, yeah, like like they make they're making a Rocketeer sequel. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Although like, I, I'm much more interested in the Rocketeers than I am in a World War Z equal. But if Dave Fincher directs this, like I'm gonna have to see it. Like, yeah, like I got no choice. Like he's one of my favorite directors of all time, and I see everything he does. Uh, like, I, I gotta see a World War Z equal directed by Dave Fincher, and I would much rather he do anything else. But, like, if this happens, he can make a really good movie. Like, he can make I, a cool World War Z equal. Yeah, I think a uh, David Fincher adaptation of the novel, like, with the person, like, with someone trying to collect the history of what happened, like, that would be really cool. That would be very cool, yeah. That would be really awesome. So who knows? Who knows what could happen? Yeah, who knows what could happen? Uh, so that's, I guess that's film news for today, right? With our yeah. speculations on World War Z equal. I don't think that'll happen, the Dave Fincher directing World War Z too. But he also doesn't have any other movies on the docket, really. He, he <laughs> was, t- there was supposed to be that remake of Strangers on a Train that he was attached to. Oh, what? I don't remember. Oh, wait, I think I do remember yeah. that. Yeah. We definitely talked about it. We it talked was, about it, yeah. It, that was like over a year ago. Uh, yeah. And there's been nothing on it since. Uh, yeah, was so, it, I can't remember. I don't think. It, I guess it wasn't David Fincher then. Who's one of the? Or, or, uh, who's like I'm going to retire and make this TV thing, and then I'm done. And then he was like, "JK, I'm coming back." But no, that was the guy who did the Nick. But I can't remember his Steven name. Steven Soderbergh. Steven Soderbergh. Yeah, yes. there we go. Yeah, uh, yeah. He did retire. The or, I mean, he kept saying it was kind of a general, like it wasn't going to be a full on retirement, but it was still like he retired from movie making after making like two movies a year for twenty years. Yeah, uh, and then. Uh, like, he was like, I'm done. And then, like, during his three-year retirement, he ended up directing every episode of two seasons of The Nick. Uh, <laughs> uh, and he also started his... He did, like, fan edits of movies. He did a fan edit of Psycho. Uh, Wait, what? He started his own t-shirt line on his on his site. He God. wrote a novella on Twitter. I'm in uh, love with this man now. Yeah, I uh, remember the novella, yeah. Yeah. Uh, if, if you follow... I mean, I'm sure it's, you can collect it online somewhere. Like, I'm sure there's an archive of all that stuff. 
Yeah. Uh, but he, like, every once in a while, like, I follow him on Twitter. His, his Twitter name is at uh, Bituation. And <laughs> if you if you follow if you followed him on Twitter during that time, it was like that whole summer. Uh, you'd just be like scrolling through Twitter randomly, and then you see he would tweet, and it'd be like all caps, chapter thirty seven. <laughs> yeah. And then there would just be like your entire feed for the next hour would just be chapter thirty seven of <laughs> this novella that he wrote. That's awesome. Uh, what it was a, what crazy. A hero. Yeah. So. I mean, bold, bold experimental artist. I love Steven Soderbergh. Uh, yeah. And he is directing another movie uh, soon. I don't remember what it's about or what it's called, but I think Daniel Craig's in it. Uh, so that'll be something. So I'm in, yeah. But in any case, that wraps up film news and a little discussion of Steven Soderbergh also. Uh, yeah. And now let's move on to our discussions, Mike. These are my discussions. Just when I thought I could talk about movies all day, I talked about more, so we're going to talk about them today. These are my discussions. There is so much to see you and me, so we're going to talk about movies for our discussions. All right, Mike, let's get into some discussions. What do you want to discuss today on the film bookcast? The official uh, podcast of filmbook.com. <laughs> nice, Mike. Nice plug. <laughs> Um, a plug so for, things, it's a what? plug for the podcast that you're listening to right yeah, now. Right in the middle of the podcast. <laughs> good, good job. <laughs> uh, so the thing I have to discuss today is Jason Bourne, the uh, fifth movie in the Bourne the universe, I guess. Okay. You can say franchise. Franchise, franchise, it's not, yeah. It's not quite a universe. It's four movies and a spinoff, right? Like that's Right. <laughs> At this point, everything is a universe. Sure, um, sure. So we have uh, Matt Dillon back and Paul not Greengrass Matt, is Matt, back. Matt Damon, not Matt Dillon. Damon, Matt Damon, what am I talking about? It'd be great if it, Matt Dillon could get like, a cool action movie <laughs> franchise. But. Oh uh, we take two weeks off and I forget what I'm doing. But. <laughs> yeah, so Matt Damon's back, Paul Greengrass is back. Right. Uh, we're, the, we're reuniting for the Bourne Powerhouse. Uh, however... It is the same Bourne movie we've seen four times at this point. I'm going to include the one that's not Bourne because right. it's the same movie also, basically. Sure. Now, have you, are you a fan of the Bourne franchise, Mike? Yeah, I, I really like the Bourne trilogy, those ones. Uh, I did enjoy the Jeremy Renner one, Bourne Legacy. Okay. Uh, for, all, for all that it was, it's a silly action movie. Well, not even silly, but it's a good action movie. And like you said, last time we talked about it, uh, it gave us chems. It did give so us chems. <laughs> <laughs> we got those chems. Are there no chems in Jason Bourne? Uh, no, no. What? I, yeah, there's no chems. There's no reds or blues or whatever they are. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, Jason Bourne, uh, it's unfortunately kind of just the same movie. Like I said, it's him trying to be dismantle something is some black ops stuff while the black ops stuff tries to kill him. Okay. I for mean, two hours. Yes. Yeah. That's, uh, that's kind of what I've heard. And here's the thing. I'm not a big fan of the Jason Bourne franchise. I really like the first one. I like Bourne Identity a lot. Uh, and the Bourne, uh, the Bourne Legacy was like, it did some interesting things despite the yeah. fact that it had, didn't have Matt Damon. Uh, I didn't like it that much, but it, was, it tried. It did some interesting stuff. I, I don't really like the ones that, that Greengrass directed. Uh, Supremacy and Ultimatum, which I know is like the opposite opinion of most people. Uh, yeah. But I, to me, his camera work really messes up those movies. Uh, <laughs> and I yeah. know that's like a selling point for a lot of people. Like that's those are the movies that really started the shaky cam uh, experience uh, or really yeah. popularized it in any way. Uh, and I, I like Paul Greengrass as a director. Like I think uh, when he uses that effects towards something like Captain Phillips, it kind of makes it feel like a documentary footage or something. And I, kind right. of, I kind of like that about that movie. Uh, but I don't think it works for the Bourne movies, and I think that that does hurt the movies. I, I do like aspects about them, but I have, I watched them all uh, right before the Bourne Legacy came out, and I was kind of disappointed by the franchise in general, because I re- actually really liked the first one. I thought it was a pretty solid, yeah. uh, very enjoyable time. Yeah, I think Ultimatum is my favorite one, uh, just because I, I don't remember exactly. I think it ends the same way the first one started, it which does. is like, yeah. yeah, with him in the water. Um, yeah. And then the Moby Song plays. Right, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which, spoiler alert, uh, plays again. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it has to. It has to at this point, yeah. Uh, but I think it does some cool stuff there. I think the Born Ultimatum has some of the most interesting action in the franchise. Uh, okay. In that it, you know, kind of one of the whole things about the Born series is them, is the, like, hand-to-hand combat. It's supposed to be really gritty. We yeah. have kind of longer drawn-out fights than we do in a normal action movie. Uh, he's murdering someone with a book like you know he's doing really crazy stuff with a hand towel yeah um <laughs> we don't really get that much stuff in 
uh, Jason Bourne. When there are fights, it's a just a drag out fist fight. There's not, nothing. I mean, there's interesting like weird stuff ha- like uh, rolling. I can't think of the right words. Like MMA type things, like them doing takedowns and all okay. that cool stuff. But there's nothing as uh, creative as the original right. film movies. Yeah, if, if, I, I mean, the one I remember the most in Ultimatum is when he, like, uses a washcloth to, to like, <laughs> wreck somebody. And he does, you know, there's cool stuff like that in those movies. In this one, we don't have that. It's a also a lot, like I said, it's the same. Uh, we're going to show a bunch of people in a dark room full of tech. Knowledge, you go and well, oh, that's Jason Bourne, and then Jason Bourne running, and that's kind of the whole, <laughs> that's kind of the whole movie. Uh, and unfortunately, in 2016, a lot of the stuff in the room full of tech, uh, I don't think can fly anymore. Okay. Especially, we have the cardinal sin of that of someone hacking away at a computer, or not even hacking. Excuse me, <laughs> like I don't want to use that term. Uh, you know, slapping the keyboard, and then they go enhance, and a screen comes into resolution, and like that, re- that really happens in this that's, movie. That's one of the biggest cliches of all time. Yeah, like, <laughs> that's really bad. Uh, yeah. like yeah. A, a horribly blurry image will just suddenly focus, and it's yeah. like, yeah, that's not. You can't do that. It's 2016. <laughs> yeah. You're not on CSI. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, I saw uh, Devinder Hardwar from the Slash Filmcast was tweeting about this movie and was making a lot of the same complaints about the technology in it. And, and he was saying, uh, you know, after, at, like, Mr. Robot exists, right? Like, he, right, right. Like, we're, we're watching stuff on Mr. Robot that's, like, the next level, like, this is exactly what this is supposed to be like. This can't fly anymore. Like, you, yeah. <laughs> you got to step up your game if you're going to do this. Yeah, uh, that's exactly what it is. Yeah, um, I also heard that uh, there's one point where there's, like, a flash drive with encrypted files on it, and it actually has the word <laughs> encrypted labeled on the yeah. flash drive. <laughs> yeah, that, that happens to, also. To show that they are encrypted. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which like we can't even like I, like you can't even have someone like, like <laughs> take that flash drive and hand it to someone and be like it's encrypted. We need to have encrypted literally like label maker li- <laughs> stuck onto it. Um, but uh, that's kind of like nitpicky stuff. Like I could have forgiven all that silly tech things um, had the plot or the action lived up to what the rest of the born stuff was. Right. Uh, but unfortunately, like I said, it feels kind of it's the fifth movie of this. And it doesn't do a whole lot of new things, so yeah, I was kind of bored with it. So, which is a shame because the Bourne, I mean, the Bourne franchise kind of made its name by being a very new take on the super spy, right? Uh, so it's kind of a shame that uh, you know it's this movie sounds like it's kind of just a redo of stuff we've seen before. Yeah, but yeah, pretty much. But that is a shame. Again, I'm not a big fan of the Bourne franchise, uh, but they always got good reviews, so I always felt like I, sort of obligated to see them. And then this one got bad reviews, and I was like, well. I you were right I, all along. I guess I don't have to go see this one. Uh, <laughs> I may I may end up watching it at some point. I do like Paul Greengrass as a director generally, just not for the Bourne movies. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but I, I may end up seeing it at some point. It's on HBO or something in a year. Uh, but yeah, I think I'm I'm skipping it in the theater. Uh, yeah. But I have a couple movies that I want to talk about for discussion, so I'll get into those. The first one is The Shallows uh, from director jean Collet Serra, who, who was the director of the excellent Nonstop with Liam Neeson. Uh, have you seen Nonstop, Mike? <laughs> I have seen Nonstop. Isn't, Nonstop is awesome. Isn't it great? That's, a, that's <laughs> such a great movie. Uh, yeah. And I've been, I've been pretty hit or miss with his work, but when it hits, it's great. Like Nonstop. And yep. uh, The Shallows is definitely a hit. <laughs> what? There's no way. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't believe you. I don't understand why you don't believe me. Uh, this is a <laughs> really great movie. It's mostly a one-person film featuring Blake Lively and her best ever performance. Uh, which... I realize as I'm saying that now, like she doesn't give a ton of great performances. But <laughs> I was going to say, is that that much of a thing? But she's very, <laughs> she's really good in this movie, and it's like a very tense, awesome thriller that gets a little ridiculous by the end. Uh, but it totally earns that ridiculousness. There is a shot of Lively right after she sets fire to the ocean after shooting a shark with a flare gun, and it's it's one of the most badass things I've ever seen. Like it's <laughs> it's so good. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of The Shallows. I think it's really good. I think it's one of the best movies of the summer. Uh, and very much worth checking out. Uh, you know, it's it's a movie that uh, I think snuck up on a lot of people. Like, it got pretty good reviews uh, if you if you look at like the consensus and Rotten Tomatoes and stuff. And actually, uh, if you're if you're a member of Film Twitter, by which I mean if you follow like a lot of movie critics, uh, yeah. there's <laughs> there is a subsection of movie critics that are really big Jean Collet Sarah fans. Like, <laughs> like he has like this own like mini fan club on movie Twitter, 
Uh, oh that is really that's really funny. And so they uh, they they're all been championing been championing the sh- the shallows a lot o- over the past few weeks. Uh, but the shallows is awesome. Definitely check that out if you can. Uh, one of the other movies I saw this weekend uh, was Sausage Party, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know I went. I kept saying I'm going to the sausage party tonight, and also I'm going to a movie. <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, top uh, level comedy. Right? Oh man, I'm the best. Uh, well, I was pretty excited about this movie because uh, I, I had been hearing about this project for years. I'm always interested in what Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg are doing, and you know, an R-rated animated movie. I was like, all right, that hasn't been done in a long time. Uh, I, I do want to see where this is going, and I left feeling a little bit disappointed. Uh, kind of like that's it. Like uh, <laughs> to me, to me, uh, the novelty of food cursing and wanting to have sex kind of wears off after a few minutes. <laughs> Yeah, and, from the things I've seen, that's mostly it. Yeah, and uh, what we're kind of left with isn't really funny enough to warrant like a ninety-minute runtime. Uh, it does explore a lot of deeper themes, uh, which you wouldn't expect it to. But it, it, de- it explores a lot about the role of religion in society and how racism <laughs> happens, and especially the conflict between Israel and Palestine is like a part of this movie. Uh, <laughs> and so, <laughs> what? Okay, so you're like that kind of stuff uh, would be all about, if it, like with the food and the anime, like yeah. And th- th- I really give you credit for that, and I think uh, that's kind of what frustrates me is I really wanted to like this more, and those elements are like that's re- that's really good. That's a really good start, but it just I just didn't find it that funny. I chuckled throughout. I was yeah. you know I had like the baseline chuckle. Like, I, I don't think Seth Rogen can, can make a movie and not have me laugh at some point. Because uh, I'm such a big fan of his, and I think he's really funny. Uh, also, the ending, totally bizarre and meta. Okay. And I'm usually all about that, but again, that didn't really work for me that much. It felt like kind of a cop-out, but it lines up a sequel that I would be really interested in seeing, and one that supposedly Seth Rogen wants to make. Like, that's what it's... Like, I thought of it as I was leaving the movie theater, and then, like, the next day I happened to see Seth Rogen talking about the idea for a sequel, and it was exactly what I had thought of after the ending. Right. And uh, should I get into that? Should I just ex- t- tell you what the ending is? Uh, I mean, I don't care. So. Right. <laughs> Spoilers yeah. for an animated movie about food fucking each other. <laughs> Starting now. Starting now. Uh, the ending of this movie has uh, the, the food participating in a big orgy. And then right after that, uh, you know, the main characters get called away by uh, one of the other characters, uh, like a box of lighter fluid or something, voiced by Bill Hader. Uh, and he tells them that he builds a Stargate. <laughs> Okay. Uh, and tells them that, you know, they thought they were just the playthings of these humans that eat them, but they're actually cartoon characters, and they're the playthings of these <laughs> real-life people. And they show, like, a picture of Seth Rogen, and they show a picture of Edward Norton, who voices the bagel in this movie. Uh-huh. Uh, and so they enter the Stargate and enter the real world, and then it cuts to the credits. Oh, my God. Uh, and the idea that I had for, this, for a sequel, and the idea that Seth Rogen has been batting around... Uh, you know, short like a couple days after this movie's come out, uh, is a Who Framed Roger Rabbit style movie with the food encountering their real life counterparts. That's amazing. Uh, which is like, yeah, like. <laughs> so, so even though I wasn't crazy about Sausage Party, uh, and I feel like it kind of disappointed me, I would see that sequel. Like, I think that's <laughs> that's a pretty wild idea. Yeah, that's that's a pretty interesting and bold choice. Uh, um, and there's also been a lot of uh, of hubbub about. Uh, the production of the of the movie that's come out since Sauce's Party I, came I did out. I see that. It turns out, I guess, a lot of the animators were uh, not compensated properly. Uh, there was a lot of overtime that went unpaid and stuff like that. A lot of people were yeah. fired, uh, and that that apparently about forty people are uncredited that worked on the movie. Yeah, which is pretty insane. I don't. Uh, it's pretty wild. Yeah. I think they were saying, you know, like Seth Rogen probably doesn't even know about this. Uh, yeah, he did, he doesn't run the animation comp- uh, studio, so it'll be interesting to see what the reaction is going forward from here. Uh, yeah, what he does, like, now that it's public, like, what he's going to do about it. Because uh, he's, cause he's right. really the face of this movie, him and Evan Goldberg. Uh, right. So, so, the director of this movie, uh, actually, is Con- I think Conrad Viernan and Greg something. Greg Tiernan and Con- Conrad Vernon, I think are the two names. And one of them used to work at DreamWorks. The other one mostly directed Thomas the Tank Engine movies. <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah. Okay. So, that's quite a career change. That's amazing. Uh, <laughs> Good for that guy. Yeah. Uh, but if that, if that's true, that they were unfairly uh, dealing with their yeah. animators, then that's pretty messed up. But, uh, yeah. you know, 
in any case, who knows? Uh, that, that's that's uh, you know I, I came down on this movie a lot. I will say it got pretty good reviews, and a lot of people liked it a lot more than I did. So your yeah. mi- your mileage may vary. You know, comedy is subjective, sir. True. All movies are subjective, but comedy in particular is like really harder to pin down. Uh, even like this is a movie that I expected to really like. You know, right? It seems right up my alley. But it was like, I feel, I, to me, it felt like it crossed the line of dumbness just a little too much. <laughs> And I love yeah. a lot of dumb things. You know I love a lot of dumb things. I, I do know. MacGruber's in your top five. So. <laughs> exactly. Top five. <laughs> I mean, when you say top five, like, of all time? I, I'm just going to make that bold assumption about you. You're probably not wrong. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, and then finally, I want to talk about Lights Out, uh, which is the directorial debut of David Sandberg. Uh, it's a very solid, effective horror movie based on the short film that made the rounds on the internet a few years ago. Have you seen the Lights Out short, Mike? Uh, I have not, but I remember r- reading that if you saw the trailer for Lights Out, you basically saw the short film. You pretty much did. It's like a two and a half minute short. It's a good short. Uh, and, and this movie takes the concept, which is very simple. It's just, you know, when the lights are out, you see this shadowy demon person. And when the right. lights are on, you don't. Uh, so it takes the concept, finds a lot of creative things to do with it. Uh, and also, all the characters are really smart and competent. <laughs> and- I love that that's like a, a new thing. <laughs> But it's true. Uh, it's, it's, it has a central metaphor about dealing with mental illness, which mostly works. It's a little wonky if you think about it too much, but it's fine like in the moment. Uh, and in particular, the, uh, the boyfriend character, Brett, gets a lot of smart moments. Uh, and every time he did something smart, there's like a scene where like he's getting attacked by the monster and then pulls out his phone and uses the flashlight on his phone and the monster disappears. Uh, or there's a scene where he uh, is getting picked up by the monster while he's outside and like, turns on his car, and the car headlights come on, and he drops to the floor. And every time that something like that would happen, I would quote Pulp Fiction in my head and be like, Whoa! Check out the big brain on Brett! <laughs> God <damn it>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, You're not wrong, though. Yeah. Uh, so that was cool. Yeah, I, I very much enjoyed Lights Out. I think it's a very solid horror movie. Uh, produced by James Wan as well. I think David Sandberg is actually directing Annabelle 2 uh, as his next film. And I, I know there's a sequel to Lights Out, uh, kind of, in development too because it was a pretty solid head of the box office uh so we'll see what happens I, i'm interested to see where david sandberg's career goes from here yeah uh but that about wraps up for discussions mike are you ready to move on to our featured review of suicide squad uh, i think i'm ready i don't know if we i don't know if we're prepared for this but we've at the same time we've waited two long weeks we've got yep. so many thoughts to get off our chests. so yep. let's let's do this let's get into our review of suicide squad starting right now i want to build a team of some very bad people who i think can do some good Y'all jokers must be crazy. I'm not just one of y'all many toys. What? This is the deal. You disobey me, you die. Try to escape, and you die. You got a boyfriend? You irritate or vex me. I'm known to be quite vexing. I'm just forewarning you. You die. If they get caught, we throw them under the bus. What a ride! All right, it is time for our featured review of Suicide Squad, written and directed by David Ayer. The movie stars Will Smith, Margot Robbie, Jared Leto, Joel Kinnaman, Viola Davis, Jai Courtney, Jay Hernandez, Adewale Akinoe Agbaje, I might have mispronounced that, Mike Barinholtz, Scott Eastwood, and Cara Delevingne. Uh, the IMDb plot synopsis of this movie reads, A secret government agency recruits a group of imprisoned supervillains to execute dangerous Black Ops missions in exchange for clemency, which inevitably leads to chaos. And I feel like that plot synopsis accurately sums up what's wrong with this movie. Because, <laughs> <laughs> which inevitably leads to chaos, right? Like, that's like, yeah, it's inevitable. Yep. You you got this group of supervillains that you're like, yeah, they'll do, they'll, they'll work, they'll save the world. Why? Why would they do that? Right. <laughs> Why would you think that's a good idea in the first place? Uh, yep. But we're going to get into that in a little bit. Mike, are you a fan of uh, director David Ayer? Who is the director uh, of this movie? I, honestly, I don't remember other... I can't think of anything that he's made, so he refresh was, my memory. He was the writer of Training Day, Denzel Washington. He also directed End of Watch. Uh, which, okay. Uh, he also directed Fury with Brad Pitt. Uh, yeah. I've only seen End of Watch, uh, and i got I got to tell you, I was not a fan of that movie. I did not see End of Watch or Fury, but I have seen Training Day. Okay. How, how uh, was it? I remember really liking Training Day. Okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, so I guess in theory I would be. 
a fan of his one script that you that you that I've seen. Yeah. Direct, yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. So I I had so much hope for Suicide Squad, man. Though, because yeah. I mean, this was the movie that was supposed to save the DC universe, right? Right. Uh, you know, because they came out with Man of Steel, and it was bad. Or I mean, I, <laughs> lukewarm, lukewarm. I thought it was bad. Most people like it divided a lot of people. It was a very right. divisive film. Yes. Uh, and then they were like, okay, we hear your complaints, and we're going to use those complaints to help make Batman v Superman better. But it was worse. Uh, right. <laughs> Batman v Superman was really bad. And so they were like, all right, we hear your complaints, and we're going to use those complaints to make Suicide Squad better. We're going to do reshoots. <laughs> uh, and then, like, yeah. Not man. so much. Not so yeah. much. It, it feels like every time DC comes out with a new movie, they're Johnny Depp playing Ed Wood and Tim Burton's Ed Wood. And, it's, <laughs> and he's, like, on the phone in the studio. And it's like, really? The worst film you ever saw, huh? <laughs> well, my next one will be better. Yep. <laughs> I, and they just keep falling back on the, well, we make it for the fans, not the critics. <laughs> but, like, most of the fans hate it, too. Like, most, most fans uh, of these movies don't like them. Most, yeah, well, most fans of DC characters are not fans of these movies, I would say. I think, I don't know, there's this weird thing that's happened with Suicide Squad specifically where uh, people have, like, banded together as if they're being assaulted personally for people not liking this movie. This this has not just happened with Suicide Squad. This happens with uh, a lot of movies, like a lot of blockbuster movies based on, like, fan properties. It happens a lot with DC movies, which I think is very odd. Well, yeah, that's where I'm going, where I think that because there's this, you know, DC versus Marvel rivalry in in general. <laughs> right. And Marvel movies are generally well-reviewed. Yeah. And they've been doing a f- phenomenal job with whatever's going on. And DC is trying to play catch-up so hard with these movies. And there's this, like I said, like, there was that whole thing going, you know, people were claiming that Rotten Tomatoes was conspiring to make Suicide Squad fail. Right. As if Rotten Tomatoes is not owned by movie. Yeah, they're owned by Warner Steelers. Brothers. Yeah, Warner like, Brothers what? made Suicide Squad. <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, that's I don't know, and and like whenever a critic comes out with a negative review, all the fans take it like personally. Like I said, right. uh, that's been happening for a while. There was I remember there were like critics that were sent death threats over their reviews of The Dark Knight Rises, and yeah. that was a movie that got mostly good reviews. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's just a symptom of the internet, I guess. Yeah. But it's, uh, got, it's gotten much worse over the past couple of years. I think with yeah. like with Batman v Superman and with Suicide Squad, it's reached its like zenith, where like these people are so blind in their DC fanboyism that they can't take criticism about the thing they like, and it's fine if they like it. Like I don't, right. I don't care if you like Suicide Squad. I think that's I'll, the other thing. I'll too. judge you silently, but I don't care. But like, I can still be your friend, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. Like, because we come out. Or, I, as I assume, so, as you can tell by our tone, uh, we're going to tear this movie apart. But, like, <laughs> even if you don't like even if you do like it, like, it's fine. Like, you're still, like, you could still be a person, even if I don't <laughs> exactly. like Like, whatever. Yeah, that's what makes human life so interesting. Yeah. <laughs> we have different reactions to the art we experience. <laughs> that's what art is supposed to be. Yeah. Uh, and here's the thing. As I was watching this movie, I did not feel like I hated it, like, coming out of the theater. Uh, on the contrary, my immediate thought was that it wasn't as bad as everyone was saying. I was thinking, right. like, sure, it has some problems. It's kind of all over the place. The Enchantress was terrible. <laughs> the soundtrack yep. is a little much. But, hey, there was some good stuff, too, right? And then after a couple of hours, it became clear to me that when I said there was good stuff, and I was trying to explain, like, what the good stuff was in the movie to people, I was almost always just referring to the performances of Will Smith and Margot Robbie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I came to the realization that those two are so good in those roles that they overshadowed a lot of the movie's flaws while I was watching it. Uh, and then the more I thought about the movie afterwards, like, the more th- more flaws I found, the more problems I had with it. Uh, and, you know, it was, like, even while watching the movie, I was like, I feel very conflicted about this because I know there's, like, stuff that's wrong in this scene. <laughs> yep. But, like, I'm having fun watching Will Smith, like, kind of being in an action movie again, which I haven't seen in a long time. Uh, you know... But, they, like, Will Smith and Margot Robbie are so good in those roles, they almost make you forget how terrible the movie they're in is. Uh, <laughs> which is. Yeah. Which is a testament to how good they are as movie stars. Like, they're true movie stars, doing right. what the movie stars should be able to do, which is make you want to watch anything just for them. Right? right? Yeah, that's a good point. So, that all out of the way, Mike, what was your thoughts on Suicide Squad? <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that your answer? <laughs> so, now that we just kind of shit all over this movie... <laughs> 
<laughs> Give us your real thoughts. <laughs> Tell us how you really feel. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like we said, basically, uh, this movie feels very uh, all over the place. It seems kind of like they couldn't figure out what they were trying to do. Um, it's at moments feels super tone deaf to what uh, what it's doing already. Yeah. Uh, the uh, flashy fluorescent black light weird uh, stuff that was all the the promotional imagery yeah um, and all the marketing and things is not in the movie other than when we're shown like like we're a file will get thrown down on a table and they'll open it and be like this is dead shot and then we get like weird like black light fluorescent weird text and all this stupid stuff and then we go back to our normal action movie yeah uh, <laughs> So it's very all that that edgy. Uh, um, I can't think of the no. What's that stupid store? Hot Topic. There hot we topic. go. Yeah, that like edgy sixteen year old Hot Topic shit that's all over the marketing is a barely is barely in this movie and feels very shoehorned and forced. Absolutely. Like you said, the soundtrack. Basically, this feels like they were <laughs> people were like, "Oh shit, we have to make Guardians of the Galaxy. How do we do that?" And they're like, okay, take the top 40 song, make it look, put some weird text over it, and we're just going to do it. And that's kind of the whole movie. And like, that's what this whole movie feels like. Yeah, I agree. This is, this is a nothing movie. Like, yes. It is, it is a mishmash of nothing on top of nothing else. Like, it's, it's a movie that feels very cut to hell by the studio uh, in an effort to kind of make the film more fun, like in response to the criticisms that were lobbied against Batman v Superman. Right. Uh, and uh, my problem with Batman v Superman isn't that it's not fun. My problem with it is that it's bad. Like, <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. Uh, and it's, the thing is, like, they it feels like you know they were, there were reports about reshoots going on like right around the time Batman v Superman came out uh, yeah. when people were complaining about how dark and unfun it was, and it was right around the time the Suicide Squad trailer came out, which made like made it look like a very fun time. Like it made yeah, it look Bohemian like Rhapsody. We get all like all that yeah, exactly. Uh, but that was not the movie David Ayer was making, apparently. Uh, yeah, no, I don't, I don't <laughs> like, think so. That trailer was a huge misrepresentation of what the movie was, and so they did the reshoots to try to make it more like the trailer, which should be the opposite way around. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, yep. it, you know, so it seems like it kind of goes against what David Ayer was originally going for in this movie, which seems fairly dark and gritty. The entire movie takes pl- or the entire second half of the movie takes place at night, uh, yep. and honestly, I don't think the original vision seemed like it would have been all that good in the first place. <laughs> Right. But it might have had, like, an identity of its own. You know, it might have had, like, a thesis statement. You know, it is bizarre <laughs> yeah. that in 2016, uh, we've gotten a grim, dark version of Superman and a light and breezy version of a bunch of DC villains. Yes. <laughs> like, it should be the other way around, right? Yep. Yeah. I think uh, the issue, though, like you said, it may, might have had a thesis statement. Uh, and I think one of my other big issues with this film is that it, has a th- sort of has a thesis statement, except it's fucking tattooed on everyone's face. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Joker has damage, has damage tattooed on his face. Harley Quinn has rotten tattooed on her face. <laughs> Diablo literally has the word Diablo tattooed on his face. Uh, and we're, we're, we're told, not shown, so much of this movie where, uh, you know, there's a scene where they're walking through the city trying to get to wherever they're going, and Harley Quinn smashes a window and steals a pocketbook. And she's like, what? We're villains. <laughs> like, yeah, I fucking know. Like, we know you're yeah. a villain. You they don't s- have to say it all they, the time. And they say it a couple times throughout the movie. A like, bunch of times. Guys. <laughs> yeah. It's, so, it's what we do. Yeah. Uh, we're some kind of suicide squad. It's like, oh, my <laughs> God. That was the dumbest line in this movie. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it wasn't yeah. the dumbest line, but it was a dumb line. Yeah, uh, like, the, that's that's the biggest issue for me, is that this could have been a really cool, unique uh, opportunity for them to have, to, 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 like we said, do the gritty villains um, thing, but there's, that the Suicide Squad being villains adds nothing to the movie other than being able to say, we're the villains. <laughs> yeah, because they don't really come across as villains, as especially by the end of the movie. They come across oh. as, like, redemptive heroes, almost. The like, one guy that we're supposed to identify with, uh, Colonel Flagg, or whatever he is... <laughs> I don't know if he's Colonel, but Flag yeah. uh, is like the biggest asshole in the movie. <laughs> We're supposed to relate to him as the normal guy, but I yeah. think I hated him by the end of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we're going to get into that uh, later, I think, too. Uh, so as you mentioned before, the plot does lift heavily from Escape from New York, which I haven't seen anybody really talking about. Yeah, I haven't uh, noticed that. So, I did notice that, so David right. Ayer, you better start paying up. Like, 
John Carpenter, Look, yeah. John Carpenter was watching out for this shit. <laughs> uh, and not only that, but it also kind of steals from the team dynamics of Assault on Precinct 13, another John Carpenter movie. Uh, right. And I think there's a version of this movie directed by John Carpenter in the mid-'80s that would have been superb. <laughs> That's it, Well, actually, you know, it's really funny that you say that. Um, because I think the version of this movie where, like I said, the, them being villains adds nothing. And this should uh, slash it is a superhero plot. Yes. It, them trying to stop uh, a supervillain from enacting their plan to destroy humanity. Yeah. Uh, which, which, by, then, which, by the way, that supervillain was on the Suicide Squad, thus proving that the Suicide Squad was a terrible idea in the first place. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, I'm okay with, cons- like, con- you know, suspending my disbelief that a bunch of villains would work together. For- and they even make the joke, 10 years off a triple life sentence. Like, yeah. For nothing. Like, okay, fine, whatever. Yeah. I'm okay. I'm on board with that. Yeah, the thing is, like, yeah, a nihilistic John Carpenter adventure that was very low stakes, like a combat mission or something with these characters. Yes. Be great! Like, that would yeah. be good! <laughs> there is there is an amazing DC animated movie with the Suicide Squad called Assault on Arkham, where uh, the Joker takes over Arkham Asylum and he's planning to release everyone, you know, it's a classic Batman, you know, DC thing. Um, but they need to send the Suicide Squad in because Harley Quinn used to work at Arkham Asylum, so she knows all the ins and outs of the building. And the whole movie is them trying to break in to fortified Arkham Asylum. That's it. And it's awesome. It's really cool. It's a really low stakes, I mean, all things considered, uh, low stakes, kind of like war movie of them trying to assault one building. Yeah. And that would have been awesome for this. That would even. Great. Yeah, that type of movie where it's a small like them trying to steal something or whatever. That's what it should have been. This isn't this isn't Superman. Like it doesn't, exactly. it doesn't have to be. You know. <laughs> and and the you know it was really funny going in the very. I was I had heard review reviews and things of, you know, this is a superhero plot. Like it's no them being villains doesn't add anything. And I was like, yeah, where the fuck is Superman? He would show up for this. Well, and the movie goes to great pains to remind me that Superman is quote unquote dead. I do. I I did like that that it kind of followed up on that ending of Batman v Superman, though. Even yes. though I, I didn't like Batman v Superman, I didn't like this movie, but I appreciate yeah. the continuity between the two films. No, I do. You're right. Because uh, that's what I was... Superman would have showed up to stop this. Yeah. Uh, I also I also do want to throw in real quick. I do appreciate that this movie is stylistically very different from Man of Steel and Batman v Superman. Yeah. Uh, and I, again, they're both bad. Right. But, <laughs> but like, it, it feels like it's a, it has a different kind of vibe than Batman v Superman had. Yeah, uh, it's not a good vibe, but it's a vibe. Uh, and, you know, with the Marvel movies, I feel like a lot of them sort of feel like Marvel movies. Uh, and right. DC, where DC could succeed is by letting the filmmakers just run wild and do their own thing and have all their movies kind of feel different, but still kind of take place in the same universe. I don't even think the universe idea is that good anymore. I don't think the DC universe shouldn't exist. I feel like they should have kept what they were doing with Nolan going and just had, like, solo superhero series for all their heroes. Yeah, uh, and then maybe have like a multiverse thing at the end or something. Like I, I don't know. It's just <laughs> yeah, it, it could have been really cool to do that and just like have winks and nods to the other movies and stuff. Yeah. Um, but I, yeah, I, I agree with what you're saying because the 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 what makes the Marvel movies and we all, we talk about all the time, especially like in Civil War. Yeah, in Civil War, uh, we get the silly interactions between all of the people. Right, and this movie. <laughs> Feels very much like Will Smith was like, I'm the main character, I'm not doing it. Because <laughs> he's the only one we get We get the most backstory, the most time we spend with. Yeah. And like you said, <laughs> when we talked about it, you don't get the Fresh Prince and not use him as the main character. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sure. Which is true. But there's so many characters in this movie that, like, I forgot were there until they were necessary for the plot. Every, <laughs> every single character besides uh, Deadshot, Harley Quinn... Maybe El Diablo. But even him is like, well, yeah, he gets like four or five lines. Okay, he's necessary for the plot. Now he's important. Yep. Uh, Here comes Killer Croc's moment. Here yeah. co- <laughs> uh, Amanda Waller has a pretty significant role, too. She's like, Okay, like, yeah. The, uh, I, I, meant, I meant of the actual, oh, the actual the squad. suicide well, that's, squad villain. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, this movie's trying to ape Guardians of the Galaxy so much. Yeah. And what that movie did so effectively, it only has five members, eh? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it has less to introduce. Yep. Uh, and it actually spends some time to introduce them, like instead of just giving us twenty second segments of an introduction three times in a row. Uh, <laughs> that, was, uh, that was yeah, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute. But like Guardians of the Galaxy, like you know, there's a lot of depth to all the characters. Every character kind of gets their moment. Even a character like Groot, 
whose only line is I am Groot over and over and over again yep. feels like a three-dimensional fleshed out character. <laughs> he has a full fucking arc. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> he, can only, he only has one line of dialogue. Like, give me something that Killer Croc said or did in this movie that was anywhere remotely resonant toward, like, like compared to what Groot did in the Guardians of the Galaxy. Right. You know? Right. Like, all Killer Croc did was make a joke about B.E.T. Like, that was like... Right. That was it. Which is oh, kind of yeah. racist. Like, <laughs> kind of? Well, that's pretty racist. That's another thing, actually, I want to talk about. I forgot. Yeah. Every, almost every one of these characters... Oh, okay, maybe not every one of these characters, but most of them are just fucking stereotypes of their race. A lot of them, yeah. Uh, Kill, Killer Croc, uh, El Diablo, Latino gangbanger. El Diablo is a Latino gangbanger covered in tattoos. Yeah. Uh, Captain Boomerang is an, is an alcoholic Australian. <laughs> Katana is a samurai Japanese person, kind of, who only speaks Japanese. Yes. <laughs> like, like <laughs> there's more shots of Harley Quinn's ass than there are backstory for both characters. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. That's true. Yeah, she's just a hypersexualized mentally ill woman yeah uh like it doesn't <laughs> and again margaret robbie's great in the role yeah she does an awesome like, job great casting choice for harley quinn uh she's not given much to work with here like she's really like there's like all the material is bad all of her like one-liners kind of grown worthy uh it's it's yeah. rough uh i, I think also... that's that's another thing too yeah. this movie feels very much like i said an edgy hot topic 16 year old crowd uh the the shot of the joker when he like is in his room and he like falls backwards laughing and there's like all the knives and guns arranged oh around him. I laughed so much. During, <laughs> yeah. during that scene. That was so fucking stupid. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. Look yeah. at how deep and tortured I am. Uh, I have damage tattooed on my forehead. Like <laughs> that could have been his only line. <laughs> I have damage tattooed on my forehead. Could have been his line. <laughs> Yeah, because yeah. that's his whole character. That is, like, that is. It's, <laughs> he's also he's also not much. He's not in much of the movie. We should say. And oh, thank God. Uh, the thing is, I I didn't think his Joker was terrible. It's not good, but it's not terrible. Uh, but he's he's in so little of the movie that it doesn't really matter. Like, yeah. Uh, and even then, I think most of his scenes could have been cut without like any effect on the plot, like at all. Yep. Uh, I think uh, we it could have been really interesting for. His him to be there for the the Harley Quinn backstory stuff that we see him in. Sure, and even and, then, and I feel like you might not have even needed to have him there. You could have had like the back of his head or something. Like, yeah, yeah. So that, I always think that way that, we can cast somebody good as the Joker next time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess I'll save it for spoilers. But there's only one other time that he's necessary and is interesting. Right, and even even then, it's not interesting. Yeah, uh, I will say also I want to talk about Enchantress because she is okay. fucking terrible. Uh, <laughs> Uh, like we mentioned this she does not belong to this movie right she looks yeah. ridiculous uh, and the world narrative clashes with what this movie should be which is like that black ops mission for the government small scale stuff even then she should only be there as a last res- the, the team should only be there as a last resort right right like they only they only need to call the suicide squad when they have no other way to turn to right uh, and yet they're the first one they're the first ones they call <laughs> for, for this mission <laughs> despite yeah. the fact uh, well I'll talk about that in spoilers uh, but it's yeah. <laughs> but let's just say there are other heroes running around they could probably contact <laughs> right that are established as working in this movie uh yeah okay okay oh man there's another thing that i wanted to talk about also but i guess i'll say it for spoilers yeah there's a couple of, uh, i i probably know what you're talking about I d- definitely spoilery stuff there. yeah uh but yeah like enchanters looks stupid like it looks really fucking dumb uh, i think she i think she looks cool th- in the the pre like when she's introduced and like the the when she's like the muddy witch thing, okay. And then the like when she gets her hot back and all that. I'm mostly thinking about the end of the movie. Yeah. Uh, in which she ha- she's like dancing in front of a portal for like most of it. <laughs> yeah. Like that's that's her attack, quote unquote magic. Like yeah. I don't. And it's I was talking about this movie with my brother, and he was like he was telling me like he and his friend could not stop laughing during that scene because you had to keep um, like and I was thinking about this too. I was imagining the what it was like on set <laughs> while they were while they were filming that scene and you have David Ayer in the background going no more wiggling you need to <laughs> wiggle more <laughs> oh man you're not Poor. wiggling enough <laughs> you know that she was definitely just in like a green morph suit in front of a gr- in front of a screen like yeah you're right i didn't think of that <laughs> it's terrible uh but the thing is about enchantress what like the thing about Enchantress and the Joker, 
why not just have Joker be the villain of the movie if you're going to include him in yeah. the movie? Cut out the Enchantress because she's terrible and she does <laughs> not serve the plot of this movie at all well. Uh, give Joker a bigger role and then have the squad have to take down his gang or something and that's the movie. Right. You that's, know? Yeah, that's exactly. Uh, and, which that's... Would, and it would make Harley's arc kind of mean something. <laughs> You know, yeah. if she's if she's forced to fight against Joker for fear of death, like right. that that could be really powerful. That could be really interesting. But no, but no, <laughs> it doesn't do that. It doesn't go anywhere near that. No. Instead, it gives you this kind of like it kind of paints the Harley Joker relationship as a loving one, right? Which, which it's not. <laughs> that's the th- yeah. That's another thing too. It it totally glamorizes the. Uh, manipulative, abusive, damaging relationship that is Harley and Joker, and it's like, no, they're in love together. Yeah, like, like no, <laughs> like what? <laughs> yeah, like Har- like I don't know. It's it's weird because at first it seems like it's kind of going to subvert that, right? When right. it starts out, it's like Harley's kind of escaping the shadow of the Joker. She's understanding, like you know, uh, the Joker's behind her, and she's like moving on with her life, sort of. Uh, and she's like understanding that what the Joker did to her was bad, but she's insane now, so whatever. Yeah. Uh, but then, Which like, is bullshit in itself. Yeah. <laughs> but like, you know, then like halfway through the movie, it kind of just pivots, and it's like, you know, no, the Joker and Harley love each other. What are you guys talking about? Yeah. <laughs> Joker's a good boyfriend, guys. <laughs> yeah. Buy our t-shirts. Yeah. That's another thing. <laughs> That's another thing that uh, this movie did, or at least Jared Leto's Joker did for to me, was I was so uncomfortable every time he was on screen, and not because he was such a menace. Like, in Dark Knight, which, I, it's a really unfair comparison to make, because right. I don't think anyone could beat... He, he like co- the Joker is, like, one of the most iconic performances of the last, like, 20 years or so. Like, it's... Yeah. That's, it's amazing. Well, I don't think anyone will ever top the Joker as that. Um... And for me, the reason I'm so uncomfortable when Heath Ledger's on screen is because he's such sure, sheer chaos and anarchy. There, you, you can go anywhere, do anything, yeah. and you don't know. And he feels like a real person, right. too. That's what's terrifying about it. Jared Leto's Joker is just like, I'm going to rape you soon. And that's the whole, <laughs> that's his whole, that's all of his menace for me, is that yeah. he's so rapey and manipulative and he's like, a, he's portrayed as like a pimp, and they like, I don't, uh, which is weird and gross and uncomfortable. Yeah. And that that kind of undermines the Joker in some way, to me at least, for, and, for my vision of the Joker. And he feels very cartoonish too. Like it doesn't feel like a real person could be the Joker, which I I could kind of I'm fine with that if that's the direction the movie was going in. But it doesn't really feel like a cartoon. It doesn't really feel like it was trying to be a cartoonish movie. Uh, no, a lot of the other stuff is very grounded. I mean, as much as you can be with something like the Enchantress and like yeah, all this stuff a going on, sky portal going on. Yeah, uh, yeah. But, like, no, no one else comes close to being what Jared Leto is doing with the Joker in terms of how cartoony and weird he is. Yeah, exactly. Uh, what did you think of the soundtrack of this movie? Uh, it's Guardians of the Galaxy the Lesser. Like, it, <laughs> Guardians, Guardians yeah. was cool because it had weird deep cuts from the 70s and 80s. And, yeah. like, this yeah, exactly. is, like, hard rock top 40. Pretty much. Like, also, the Guardians of the Galaxy soundtrack served, like, a narrative purpose. Yeah, right? there's, a, was, there, there's it, an arc there. Yeah, it has, an, like, the soundtrack of that movie ties in with Peter Quill's arc getting over with uh, his mother's death. Yeah, it's literally in the movie. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so that's a, it was a really clever thing that the, that movie did to include those songs, I thought. Uh, yeah. This movie, they just play songs. You know, every, uh, yeah. every 40 seconds there's a new song playing. Uh, and the thing is, when it first started, when the movie first started, a new song would play like every time a character was introduced. And I thought, okay, it's kind of like each character has their own theme song, and I can right. get behind that. Like, I can, I'm okay with that, yeah. yeah. But then, like, it kept happening after we already met all the characters. <laughs> and let's say, let's temper all the characters with four. Right. But it, did, is... it, but it did it for every time, you, like, the, there was an introduction of a character. Which, okay, that's true, yeah. Which, let's say, there's probably, like, 45 introductions of characters in this movie. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, we are, we it are sure introdu- seems that way. We are introduced to Deadshot no less than three times. Like, yep, yep, uh, very right. Like, we, like, the movie starts with an introduction of Deadshot and then an introduction of Harley Quinn. And then there's a title card, Suicide Squad. And then there's like a 20 minute scene where Viola Davis is sitting out, sitting down like a dinner, uh, explaining yeah. the concept of the Suicide Squad to these other suits, uh, and introduces every member of the team to these guys. And first he talks about Deadshot again. And I was like, all right, <laughs> we just saw him, but cool. But uh, all right. And then Harley Quinn again. And I was like, all right, we just saw her, but cool. And then there's short introductions for everybody else. Again, and I stress short, because even though they are the first two already got introductions, at the beginning of the movie, they also get the longest introductions <laughs> during yeah. this scene. And, and I feel like 
even the, those introductions, Harley Quinn and Deadshot and Captain Boomerang are the only ones we get past introductions for. All the other introductions are them already in a jail cell. Yeah, a lot of them, which yes. I mean, doesn't, that, or getting caught, or doing something like, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then after that scene, it cuts to the next scene, which is Viola Davis explaining the, su- the concept of the Suicide Squad concept again. <laughs> <laughs> this time to a board To room. a bigger group of suits. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and introducing the Enchantress again. <laughs> uh, and then, like, the next scene is, like, introducing Will Smith again, and introducing Harley Quinn again. Yeah. It's like, why? Like, why are we introducing all these characters uh, over and over and over again? Why can't we just introduce them once and then maybe come back to them every once in a while, see what they're up to, have a second act, maybe, so they can... Because <laughs> right. this movie doesn't really have a second act. It has a first act, and then it's kind of... Like, the first act, which is, like, 40 minutes of introductions, and then, <laughs> and then, and then it kind of just skips to their mission, which right. is kind of just one long walk down an empty city. Right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's also... This movie's pacing doesn't make and like sense of scale, like time doesn't make any like. The first half of this movie feels like it takes place over months. It seems yeah. like. Well, that's like I, that's probably because it keeps cutting back and forth between the past and the present because of all these. That's what that, that's what I mean. Yeah, it seems they're in the prison. They're we're back flashbacks and we're at a boardroom and prison and then all this stuff. And then the whole second half of the movie takes place over the course of like what seven hours? I don't know, like in one night. One night, yeah. And also, this movie's two hours and 15 minutes long. <laughs> this movie needs to be 90 minutes. <laughs> right. The, again, 90-minute John Carpenter thriller from the mid-'80s. Yes. Perfect. I mean, Suicide, Suicide Squad would be an, like, a, a, like a cult classic today. <laughs> Escape from Suicide Squad. I'm in. <laughs> yeah. All right. So before we end to spoilers, Mike, because I think we, we have a lot of stuff we still want to talk about, uh, yeah. do you think this movie is better or worse than Batman v Superman? Um, I don't know. Like, it, I want to say better but yeah. also like it's not it, it's just as bad also like i don't know here's the thing i feel like i enjoyed watching this more than batman v superman yeah but like batman v superman was at least kind of about something you know yeah like yeah. It, it's it has an ideology and it's not an ide- ideology that i agree with but it has one you know it's about like deconstruction of these superheroes and uh you know What's like what would happen if Superman was real? Like why would the like the world would be such a dark place? Right, because you know Zack Snyder. But you know, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's Zack Snyder's world, and we're just living in it. Exactly. <laughs> um, so it's it's not an ideology that I agree with, but it still has like a basic fundamental sense of what it wants to be, even if yeah. it's a total mess as well. Uh, but it, it, so to quote to quote uh, Walter from The Big Lebowski, say what you will about the tenets of National Socialism, dude. <laughs> At least it's an ethos. <laughs> You know? <laughs> wow. You're right. <laughs> that's, that's kind of how I felt uh, about MVP Superman vs. Suicide Squad. So I do I do yeah. think Suicide Squad might be kind of worse in its own way. Like, it's, I feel like it's kind of more enjoyable to watch. If I had to pick one, I would probably pick Suicide Squad, but MVP Superman at least has an idea of what it wants to be, so... Yeah. Uh. Yeah, I think also the, the thing is that there is some interesting action. There's some cool uh, high-speed camera stuff, which looks cool because it's raining, and that always looks cool no matter what. Um, there's some interesting things going on with the in terms of the action, but I don't know. Overall, it's just not that engaging in any way. Like you said, it doesn't yeah. didn't really hold me most of the time. I was like, all right, and I mean, like the enemies are literally like, literally don't have faces. <laughs> and they, uh, right. God. Yeah, it felt, it felt like uh, the Chitauri army in the Avengers again. Like, yeah, which and they, of, like everything in Suicide Squad seems like, oh, it's like that Marvel movie again. Like, right, right. The yeah, you're right. The, at least the Chitauri are like weird aliens, and like, uh, all right, I guess they're just fighting this faceless enemy, like you said. Uh, but in this one, those faceless enemies, and they point it out. They go to a point, like they go to pains to point this out that these were people. Like, yeah. like they take their shit off the dead body, like the watch off the body, and they're like, "Wait a second, these are people." <laughs> All right, let's just keep murdering them for the next <laughs> half hour. Like, yeah. I don't get why they would introduce, like, point that out to not do anything other than maybe because they're villains, they don't care. I don't, like, I don't. But also, like, the army is there doing it with them, so yeah. like, I don't know. The movie's fucking all over so, the place. All right, we got, I think we still have a lot, to, a lot to talk about in this movie, and we've already been talking for a while. Uh, yeah. So let's get into spoilers for Suicide Squad, starting right now. Stop it! 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 Stop it!
Spoiling it! You're spoiling everything! All right, let's get into spoilers for Suicide Squad starting right now. So uh, we should mention that Batman and The Flash both make appearances in this movie. And I'm going to say this for Ben Affleck. And, you know, maybe I didn't appreciate this enough in Batman v Superman. He's very good as Batman. Yeah, yeah, I think he's going to be an awesome Batman. Yeah, one day. (laughs) When Uh, when he makes this Batman movie. Yeah, when there's a good Batman movie that he gets to be in, that'd be great. Uh, I didn't feel like I was watching Affleck. I felt like I was watching Batman Bruce Wayne. So, you know, that's cool. Uh, And The Flash only appears for about a second, right? Yeah. Uh, And it's in the scene that shows him taking down Captain Boomerang when when we are first introduced to Captain Boomerang. This is our first glimpse of Ezra Miller as The Flash in action. And it didn't seem like anything to me. Like, I feel like yeah. this should have been a big deal. Yeah. Right? Uh, like, we were supposed to be like, oh, yeah, here's the Flash. Let's get excited because the Flash is here. But it's it takes, like, two seconds. Right. Uh, Which I guess makes sense because it's the Flash. Okay. But, <laughs> but like, the scene, <laughs> I'm giving I'm giving the movie too much credit. The scene takes, like, two seconds. Yeah. Uh, but, all like, all we've seen him up to this point is, like, grainy security camera footage and, like, a blurry vision in that movie Superman that made no fucking sense. Uh, right. So yeah. <laughs> this, this is our first time seeing him do anything. Like, they should make a bigger deal out of it. This should be a cool moment. This is kind of like our preview for Justice League. Uh, and it's nothing. Like, it's... it's yeah, he we shows, don't get to see it. He shows up, says a quip, and leaves. They don't really even explain who the Flash is. Right. Right? And if you are not a DC, like... If, you, if, you aren't, if you're not attuned to DC Comics, if you're not familiar with what's going on in the DC movie universe, you don't know who the Flash is. Right. Like, if you're just going into this movie cold, you've never read a comic book in your life, you're totally pop culture illiterate... Just woke up from a coma two days ago. Yeah, you can't just introduce a character, like like just shove throw shove him in there and be like, hey, it's the Flash, and leave. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel like that was also a big complaint we had with Batman vs Superman. It relied way too heavily on the, the the editing, the way they cut the movie. It makes you rely way too heavily on previous knowledge, like who the fuck is Dark Side and like all that weird stuff right. that's going on in Batman vs Superman that we don't get explained because it's cut out of the movie. Yeah, that like that all that stuff should have been like a post credit scene or something. Like, yeah, or, or explained. Like, it seems or like a really important part. Been nice. <laughs> it's like a really important part of the movie. Yeah, it uh, would seem. And uh, plus, like the Flash and Batman making appearances also raises questions about why Waller isn't just assembling the Justice League. Yeah. <laughs> instead of the yeah. Suicide Squad, because it seems like a way better idea. And she's even got files on the Justice League, as we see in the post credits scene. <laughs> yeah, I think that's that's what we were talking about earlier. Where if this plot had been small scale. That it would make sense that you would go for, like, the shitty, gritty villain people instead of fighting a 6,000-year-old demigod. You're not going to call the superheroes? Like, you're going to send yeah. these guys in? Like Yeah. Like, she's esta- like even if she's not established as having contact with any other superheroes, it's established that she knows Batman and Bruce Wayne. Like, At she, least, yeah. She knows who Bruce Wayne is. She knows that Bruce Wayne is Batman. Yeah. yeah which means she probably knows her shit. Like... <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and also, that scene, or the scene with the Flash... Then we cut back to Waller at the table, uh, talking about Captain Boomerang, which is what that was. Uh, and she's like, well, he survived an exper- or survived the encounter with a metahuman. Yeah, so it's a big deal that Captain Boomerang survived his encounter with the Flash. That's why he's put in Suicide Squad. Yep. So, like, we, we assume they kill people, that, like, the heroes kill people now? In I the mean, Zack Snyderverse, they do. Based on what we've seen in Batman v Superman, yes, very much yeah. so. Uh, <laughs> oh, man. But, uh, yeah. Uh, also, so there, there's a twist in this movie that the person they end up saving in the city turns out to be Waller herself. This right. is never explained, and it passes by so quickly as to be kind of confusing. Uh, like, you know, you're, they think they're saving some, like, some high-ranking official. It turns out to be Waller, and it's barely acknowledged that it's Waller. Yeah, you know? yeah. You know, this person who's forcing them to do this, like, dangerous missions and stuff. Like, yeah. she's just there, and everybody's like, oh, go, yeah. You're that person. You're that, you're, you're that person who did the thing, right? That's great. And it's never acknowledged again. And then Waller disappears without, uh, like, during the movie, without the movie acknowledging it. Like, she just kind of disappears. And then shows up during the climax, and it turns out the Enchantress has kidnapped her, which we didn't see. Like, we, uh, didn't... we sort of see it. We see it. When do we see that? Uh, when her helicopter gets shot down, and then those, like, faceless dudes show up, and they bring her to the Enchantress, and she, like, does some weird hentai thing to her face. And then we see her like that. All right, if you say so. I, uh... <laughs> well, no, I only I only say it because there's like it's it's a really silly um, <laughs> like it always. Man, thank you for smoking. Gave us the best thing of. Thank God we invented that oxygen machine. Yep. <laughs> um, because we see the enchantress, her uh, you know big evil portal in the sky stops starts, 
destroying stuff, and we see her destroy, like, a NORAD base and, like, a bunch of satellite, like, all this weird shit. And we see someone, these are top secret things, how does she even know to target them? And then we just cut to Amanda Waller with all the weird tentacles in her face. Right. (laughs) Yeah, okay. I kind of remember that. (laughs) So we Uh, see that. But I I think it kind of speaks to a larger problem with why not just streamline the, the process, make it so that the Enchantress has kidnapped Waller in the first place... And yep. have that be the Suicide Squad's mission to save Waller from the Enchantress. Yeah, that would make sense. Like, that why, would, like why add all this convoluted shit? Like, <laughs> uh, you know, why make her? Why have them save her the first time? Why didn't the movie just have that be the plot from the beginning? And actually, uh, Matt Singer, uh, movie critic, uh, wrote this really funny article called 12 Things in Suicide Squad that make absolutely no fucking sense." <laughs> uh, and I, I wrote down a couple of them, and one of them is this. What the hell is Waller doing in the middle of a skys- in the middle of a skyscraper in some abandoned anonymous city? <laughs> and why did Enchantress choose that same city to plant her evil flag? Because <laughs> if yep. she had set up shop literally any other place in the world, <laughs> she almost <laughs> certainly would have succeeded. Because the Suicide Squad is only in Midway City to rescue Waller and not to stop Enchantress. That part comes later as a matter of chance. We think <laughs> we're so yep. confused. Yeah, that's a very good point. Like, like, why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There, there's a lot of that going on. Yeah. Where, like, I I guess, but also uh, explain this more. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's, it's, it takes so many, like, narrative shortcuts that it does not earn in the slightest. Right. Uh, and one of them, which I think was one of the worst aspects of this movie, one of the, my, my least favorite things, and I hated a lot of things in this movie. <laughs> uh, we are still... We, could, we couldn't tell, Mike. We are still learning backstory about these characters before and during the climax of the movie. Like, <laughs> yeah. by, like we should have learned this stuff an hour ago. Yep. But, you know, like, right, be- right before they go to like, confront the Enchantress, you see Katana uh, looking at her sword, and Rick Flagg is like, oh, yeah, her sword holds the souls of everyone it's killed, including her dead husband. <laughs> yes. And it's like, all right, if you say so. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, maybe... <laughs> Maybe if you told me that an hour ago and built upon that and maybe made Katana like a, rec- like a real character, that could be yeah. something interesting. It's too bad, the best... it's, it's too bad <laughs> that Katana didn't do anything up to that point and that moment was tacked on at the end so that, we know that, that, so that we know that sword was for when the sword kills Enchantress, right? That's like the idea. Like when, it, when the Enchantress dies, the sword will it'll like take her down. But that yeah. doesn't happen! <laughs> <laughs> like, they don't use the sword to kill Enchantress, so what's the point? <laughs> Yep. Of telling us that the sword captures the souls of its enemies. Yeah, it's real. We're told that we're, we are told that an hour ago when Katana is introduced, but it, we don't. We're not told that it has her husband and that it has any emotional weight. Like we're not. It's, right. Like it's it's just like a weird, creepy thing that she can do. And then we move on, <laughs> and then an hour later, it's important again. And then it's not important, like you said. Yeah, it never comes up again. Uh, and, like, it's supposed to be, like, this emotionally resonant thing. Like, oh, yeah, this, this sword that took down her husband will kill the Enchantress. But it doesn't. <laughs> it's about to, and then it doesn't. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about Adam B. just Slipknot. <laughs> <laughs> and in the process of us talking about Adam B. just Slipknot, we've already talked about him more than the movie talks about him. Yep, already. <laughs> we did it already. We did it. Uh, Adam B. is introduced as Slipknot without any kind of fanfare. Like, it's already after the Suicide Squad is assembled and shows up, it's like, you know, they all get to their location, and then, like, Slipknot shows up, and it's like, oh, that's Slipknot. He can climb anything. Yeah. (laughs) Right? And that's his thing. And he just kind of shows up. He's there for the montage uh, with for M&M's Without Me when they're they're putting together all their stuff. And then they go into the city, and then he's immediately killed five minutes into the mission. Yeah. Like, what's the point of even having him there? Yeah, it's it's ridiculous. I honestly even forgot he's there for that part. <laughs> I thought, in my mind, their helicopter gets shot down, they crash, they crawl out of the helicopter, a convoy shows up, Slipknot gets out, and then dies. <laughs> and the thing is, they build up like, oh, he's, he can climb anything. And it's like, okay, maybe, <laughs> maybe, I'll, maybe, I'll, get, maybe I'll get to see Slipknot climb something. Yeah. <laughs> but I maybe don't. That'll, maybe that'll be a really important thing. But that it's he not. Needs, that he needs to climb something. He never climbs anything. And that's actually part of the other problem with this movie is, you know, most of these people don't have especially big powers, right? right. Like, okay, Slipknot's power is that he can climb anything. Great. Captain Boomerang's power is that he can throw a boomerang. Uh, <laughs> you know. That, like, literally anyone can do. <laughs> like, Harley Quinn is just crazy. That's, like, her entire thing. Yeah, and she's got a butt, basically. Yeah. 
Uh, and like Deadshot could be useful. Sure, he's super yeah. marksman. LDI- I, I, I did really think that I thought that was actually really effective. Uh, that scene where they're at the prison and they're like they want to see what Deadshot can do, and he like goes through that whole table of guns and he like is shooting all the targets and he hits the same spot on every target the whole time. That was, that was very solid. That was the third time we were introduced to Deadshot. Right. <laughs> oh, that like <laughs> barring that point, I think that was actually a really cool example of what his abilities are. Yeah, like, that, was that, was that was good. Yeah, good scene. <laughs> that was really cool. If that was the only introduction we got, it would have been cool. Yeah, and that, that's all we needed. You know, yeah, especially because uh, the other two introductions also featured how good of a shot he was. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, and, and also, so Deadshot's backstory is kind of the one that's given the most weight in this movie, I would guess. I would say, uh, other than maybe Harley Quinn and the Joker, uh, the Deadshot's backstory is that he's a single father raising his daughter, uh, and you know, he's, he's just trying to do right by his daughter or something, yeah. uh, which is okay, I guess. Uh, it comes back in the climax in the worst possible way. <laughs> because it's the daughter saying, no, you can't shoot people, Daddy, in the one situation where you want him to shoot somebody. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm pretty sure the way I interpreted it, I may, like I said, I may be giving the movie too much credit, is the Enchantress made him see that? Maybe, because we're show, we're, we get, before that, we see her implant memories for them. True, okay, maybe. That's still giving them so, that's giving them so much credit. <laughs> yeah, that's not yeah. really established at all. I don't, uh, we don't really see her, she doesn't, like, we don't see her, like, cast a spell or, like, throw her a wiggle in some weird way. <laughs> <laughs> like, we don't see her do anything to make him see that. I just kind of was like, yeah, I'll put that there. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I also wanted to mention, like all good archaeologists, Dr. June Moon immediately, bre- immediately breaks the artifact she discovers in oh. half. <laughs> <laughs> she just picks yeah. it up and he's like, snap it. Yep, and then she gets possessed by the Enchantress. Indiana yeah. Jones would weep. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that belongs in a museum. <laughs> yeah. Nope, break it in half. Yeah, that was like, like what? <laughs> I also wanted to mention Captain Boomerang leaves the squad at one point to like cap off the scene where they're all having like their emotional little moments, right? And like, oh, yeah, Rick, you're right. Rick, Rick Flag is like, all right, we're gonna. I'm going to try to save the world. If anybody wants to help me, you're more than welcome to. And then Captain Boomerang, like, just walks out and leaves. And it's right. like, ah, oh, that's kind of a funny moment. And it's like, you know, because, yeah, Captain Boomerang has no reason to stay there. He's just some, like, Aussie bank robber who didn't want to be there in the first place. So it's like, all right. Like, yeah. it, like that's, that's, it gets kind of a funny character moment. He's gone. Seconds later. <laughs> <laughs> the next cut. Yeah. Seconds later, he just comes back into the team uh, to do these slow-mo Guardians of the Galaxy walk towards the camera. Uh, yep. <laughs> you yep. know, for no reason. He just, like, shows... He leaves and then comes back much like a boomerang. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> You've been... You had that one in your pocket for two weeks. I, <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, and finally, I did want to bring this up. This is also from uh, Matt Singer's article, 12 Things That Makes No Sense to Suicide Squad. This is also about Cats and Boomerang. This uh, kind of shows how fucking useless that character is in this movie. And to be fair, there's a, he's not the only useless character. But uh, this is from Matt Singer's article. This has been driving me crazy. You shove this guy who has no apparent powers and serves no apparent purpose onto the team, mostly because he's been a fixture in the Suicide Squad comics for years. You give him literally nothing to do except in one scene, he uses a boomerang as a drone. Then, at the end of the movie, there's a moment... That involves throwing something with perfect accuracy. This big bomb that needs to be tossed into the portal and then blown up to destroy the Enchantress. Here it is! A moment where Captain Boomerang is not only useful, but he is essential. So, of course, Killer Croc throws the bomb. (laughs) How did they blow this? That one moment would have justified having this kooky bank robber with a weird unicorn fetish in the entire movie, but no. Are Captain Boomerang's throwing skills limited to only throwing boomerangs? (laughs) Can he not throw other things? If so, he's even more useless than he already seemed. Yeah, I didn't think of that at all. I didn't think of that either. Uh, I was probably checked out of the movie at that point. But uh, yeah, like that's, it just seems like a very obvious thing. Like, you know, you're including all these characters... Like, you should have something for them to do. At least one thing for these characters to do that is essential to the plot of this movie. Uh, and nothing. There's no, there's yeah. nothing. Yeah. Nothing, like, nothing in, goes on. In the one moment where he could have something to do, they didn't have him do it. <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, yeah I, oh, that's a really good point. I think also, 
another thing. <laughs> it's kind of like what we've been talking about is the p- people have nothing to do until they do have something to do. Uh, Killer Croc doesn't do anything uh, until we need to go swim underwater. Uh, Diablo doesn't do anything until he needs to blow up. I guess. Right. Yeah, um, Diablo dies at the end of the movie, right? Yeah. Like, like, well, first, before he dies, that's he completely turns into over. the god of death. Right. <laughs> that's, like, that's true, too. Uh, but it, his death is completely glossed over. I don't think I even realized that he died. Uh, yeah. When the movie ended, somebody like mentioned it, like, "Oh yeah, sad about Diablo, right?" And I was like, "What?" <laughs> yeah. yeah, he he doesn't use his powers. Then he turns into the god of death to fight this other god, uh, and then gets blown up by a bomb and dies. Right. <laughs> also, also, what? Uh, uh, this is in Matt Singer's article as well. Uh, and all of these characters have bombs in their necks. So when <laughs> when Diablo turns into the god of death, shouldn't his bomb have exploded? <laughs> Like, <laughs> oh, I didn't think of that. Logically speaking, yeah, he should have died immediately. Yep, that's a really good point. <laughs> I didn't think of that at all. Um, and I, uh, I do want to mention the Joker's uh, subplot. There's a uh, subplot that you see kind of flashbacks towards Harley Quinn and the Joker throughout the movie. Uh, and throughout the movie, you have Joker trying to get Harley back, basically. Right. Uh, most of those scenes could be cut. Like they're mostly bad. Uh, yeah. Uh, they don't. They don't serve this plot of the movie at all. There's one point where he meets up with Harley Quinn and she gets in a helicopter uh, with him, and then the helicopter gets shot down. She ends up back in the city and she ends up back in the Suicide Squad, uh, right. which could be like an interesting character moment, but it doesn't do anything with that. And we're we're sort of shown a glimpse of humanity. She's sitting on the car, really like forlorn over the loss of her uh, lover. I guess this is when the movie turns to make their story a love story. Yeah, uh, really forlorn. And then the rest of the group shows up, and she, we see her like put the face of Harley Quinn on, and she like acts crazy. Yeah, it's like, oh shit, she's got some humanity left. And then we just—that's it. We move on. That's kind of it, yeah. Uh, so it's it's weird, and I think this is going to be an interesting challenge for these movies going forward. If any of these characters end up being used again, because uh, this movie was—I mean, it did pretty well at the box office uh, for its opening weekend. From what I hear, it kind of dropped significantly its second week. But uh, yeah, I think I remember hearing. I mean, it broke a very specific record, which I think was, like, Thursday midnight... Or Thursday releases in August. Like, it broke the record. Yeah, <laughs> like, something like that. Like, something really weird. Uh, but I think that's the thing, too. Even if these it happened with Batman vs. Superman, uh, I think it's going to have the uh, the Transformers effect, where it's universally panned by critics, but still makes a fuckload of money at the box office, so they're going to keep making more. Here's the thing, though. I feel like the DC movies are making a lot of money in their opening weekends... And then complete, like, dropping really hard in their second weekends. Because, like, the hardcore fans go to see it the first weekend. D- right. D- despite any kind of bad reviews. Uh, but then yeah. after that, it's like, well, like, who cares? Who cares, <laughs> who cares about this movie? But uh, in any case, like, I, th- I think it poses an interesting challenge for them going forward. Like, if they want to use Harley Quinn and the Joker in an upcoming Batman movie. Like, we've just seen a movie where they're basically the heroes. Right. Uh, but they're going to be the villains in a Batman movie. Like, that's almost given. They have right. to be, yeah. Uh, and, like, so is Deadshot, and so is... And the thing is, that could be really interesting. Like, because we've gotten all these, like, especially for Deadshot and Harley Quinn, uh, these could be, like, characters that we've learned a lot of backstory about, and we kind of sympathize with them in some ways. And so to have them fighting against Batman, uh, there could be, like, a push and pull there. That could be a really interesting different take on ideologies going on. Yeah. I do not have faith that is <laughs> that, that is what they will do. <laughs> right. Uh, they'll probably just end up acting villainous, and if whatever happens, happens. Uh, do you do you see like a future for these characters? Do you see these characters being used again? Jared Leto has been very outspoken about the fact that a lot of his scenes were cut. Yeah, uh, and he and yeah, like he's uh, he he made a lot of press in the making of this movie for being like a method actor and like being basically an asshole to everybody on the set. Like yeah. as, as in characters, the Joker, he, like he would send the like he would send other actors like used condoms in the mail or something like that, like, <laughs> oh like really ridiculous and like horrendous shit that like any other job you would get fired for. <laughs> right. Yeah. It, it seems like he really is embracing the role of the Joker. He was super proud of what he did. Yeah, but he's very upset about uh, him not like most of his scenes being cut from the movie. I think that's what I mean. Yeah, he was like, no, there's more, man. It's like, uh, yeah, I want it's, more. It's, I don't want to want it. Yeah, I don't really want more of his Joker either. Uh, so I don't, like, I feel like, you know, going forward, like, he might be upset that they cut him out of the movie so much that he might just, like, quit. Like, maybe they'll recast the Joker, which is probably for the best. But I, I keep Margot Robbie as Harley Quinn. She's probably on contract for a bunch. 
Yeah, uh, she. Was, I mean, for all the issues that uh, I had with her character, they were very much the the editing of the movie and all that stuff. The editing not and the writing. Her. Yeah, she's very good. That's Harley Quinn. Yeah. Uh, like as soon as she was cast, I was like, "That's a perfect choice." Because I remember seeing her in The Wolf of Wall Street, and think, and that was like my first thought was like, "Oh my god!" Like, <laughs> yeah. that's perfect. That's amazing. Yep. Uh, yes. So I mean, I, I could be excited, but like you said, I, I'm not sure I have faith in them handling that opportunity well of having these be villains that we know a lot about and sympathize with. Yeah. In some way. Yeah. This is a it's huge huge missed opportunity because I do think this movie could have been great. Like, we were talking about, like, this John Carpenter-esque movie of, like, the yeah. slow stakes, like, team of, like, gritty supervillains who are tasked to do this, like, combat mission. That could be really cool. That could be awesome. Uh, and this movie seemed like it went the complete opposite direction of <laughs> whatever that was going to be, uh, which is yeah. disappointing. Uh, is there any other uh, things you wanted to add about Suicide Squad, Mike, before we wrap up? Because I feel like we've been talking about this for a while. We have. Uh, and there's, uh, there's a really good post uh, I found on Reddit that explains the movie. In perfect terms, but it's pretty long, so I won't. I'll spare us. Uh, okay, yeah, fair enough. Well, I won't read it. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, but it, maybe next it, time. It goes through the movie, uh, describing them as if they were. It's the movie is sitting at a table to play uh, a tabletop RPG with an entire team full of that guy, quote unquote, <laughs> who's just like the worst guy to play with, and right. it goes through breaks down each character and what they are with that guy, and it's amazing. <laughs> so. So definitely check out that Reddit post if you can find it. Um, yeah, I, I can tweet a link, but it's fine. I know all four of you won't read it. So. <laughs> Slam! Uh, did you, Self burn. Did you see the trailer for Wonder Woman uh, when you saw Suicide Squad? Yes, I did actually. What did you think of the Wonder Woman trailer? Uh, I think it could be really cool. I don't yeah, know. It looked cool, but here's the thing: every single DC movie's trailers have looked cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like they've had three shots now, and the best movie they've made was Man of Steel. <laughs> like, yeah, that's bad. That's a bad track record. <laughs> yeah, uh, but like Wonder Woman, director Patty Jenkins is a good director. Uh, I think it could be like uh, just based on the trailer. Gal Gadot looks like she's going to be very good. I couldn't really gauge how she, how she would be as Wonder Woman from Batman v Superman because she has nothing to do in that movie. Uh, right. But you know, she looks pretty good. I think it has like it looks like it's taking it pretty seriously. But it's you know still kind of light. Like there's quips and like occasional jokes. Like because yeah. it's like you know. A superhero movie, and I think the fact that it takes place during like 1910 or something. Yeah, and we're uh, during World War One, I, I think. I, like, I'm hoping it kind of separates it from the, that universe enough where it can be its own thing, and they just oh. let Wonder Woman be. Like, you know, just have Hopefully. it be its thing. Because, uh, yeah. man, like, like I said, you know, every time, every DC movie now, the worst movie you ever saw, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, the next one's going to be better. And, you know, we said that after Batman v Superman, it's like, Suicide Squad's going to be better, right? But it wasn't. And now, yep. okay, well, Suicide Squad was bad, but man, Wonder Woman, it's on the pike, it's coming. <laughs> Uh, it's gonna yeah. be better. It's gotta be. It has to be. Uh, <laughs> we said that about Suicide Squad. You're right. Yeah. Uh, and if, then if Wonder Woman's bad, then you know Justice League is next, and you know that's another Snyder movie. So I don't have a ton of faith in that one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, my my question is, my worry has become, when does it stop? Like, because a lot of times you'll see a movie and you'll be like, all right, they can't come back from that. But like. <laughs> And I don't mean, like, they're going to make it. I mean, like, that has ended this franchise. Yeah. But they've got, like, four movies planned. Oh, I don't know about for yeah. DC. I'm, I'm holding out for James Wan's Aquaman, <laughs> and then and then I'm out. I never thought I'd say I would be most excited for the Aquaman movie. <laughs> right. But if they can't get it together by then, then it's like, come on, well, guys. And I don't even... Uh, that's what I mean. Like, that's what happens when these, these studios have movies planned out until 2020 and stuff. Like, if these movies start bombing, do they just give up and cancel all the other movies or do they just keep, keep going That's, like I, how i mean I for, the, for the ones that are really far out if these movies start bombing like you know if wonder woman bombs then just see bombs i don't think they'll bomb but like you know, yeah they might, they're not gonna they might not yeah. do the business they're hoping uh because i know batman superman certainly didn't do the business they were hoping I don't, I don't think suicide squad will end up doing the business they're hoping right uh it, like you know they might have to rethink their strategy and i feel like the movies that are way far out like you know cyborg and green lantern and stuff like that <laughs> yeah. uh you know they they might axe those i uh there was actually recently a report that cyborg was going to be in the flash like cyborg was going to be, be cool. like a supporting actor in that movie uh which is just fine again i don't have any faith in this universe at, yeah. at this point but as far as, far as james wan's aquaman goes james wan is a director who is pretty big at this point yeah and like he's he like if he doesn't want to do a dc movie he doesn't have to 
And so the second, like, Warner Brothers starts to, like, mess with his editor or whatever, I think he would be out. Like, he would just leave. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I think you have a good point. Uh, and I don't, I, don't, I don't think they'll mess with him because he's also the one making those Conjuring movies, which have been doing very good bu- business for Warner Brothers. Right. Uh, you know, and, you know, he made Furious 7, which made, ha- like, a billion and a half dollars in the box office. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, so I feel like James Wan is in a very good position to just be able to make his own movie. Oh, e- I everyone, really hope so. Everyone else is, like... Kind of on their own, sort of percent direction, except for uh, Ben Affleck. Ben Affleck is also directing yeah. his Batman movie, and that you know he's an experienced director. He's a superstar actor, uh, so in theory they would let him do whatever he wanted. Theoretically, because you know he's their Batman, they got to keep him happy. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> got to keep him happy uh, off screen because Batman has to be unhappy on screen. Obviously, <laughs> it's the Snyderverse, man. We're all. Just <laughs> Uh, uh, all right, that's, we gotta stop. That's yeah, enough. we gotta stop. We've been talking about we've been talking for like two hours now. Uh, <laughs> but, all right, Mike, where can we find you online this week? Find me at twittercom slash blog And if you like Dungeons and Dragons, my friends and I post all of our games at youtubecom slash geonerd 79 All right, and you can find me online at twittercom slash blog as well as all my podcasts at filmbook.com. Thank you for listening to Film Bookcast. I'm Mike Smith. If you're listening to this review via our podcast on iTunes, please subscribe to the podcast, rate it, take a moment, give us a review. That goes for any podcasting service that you happen to listen to as well. Any and all feedback, compliments, topic discussions, and even hate mail can be sent directly to podcast at filmbook.com. Please list the podcast you're emailing about in the title of your email because we produce so many different ones hard to keep track. We would love to hear from you. Join us in two weeks for our next episode. Now, the summer movie season is wrapping up and award season isn't quite underway yet. Uh, so right. we're in this kind of like weird middle period where there's nothing huge coming out. But I think uh, Don't Breathe, the new movie from Fede Alvarez, who's the director of the Evil Dead remake, looks to be worth checking out. So I think that's what we should try to review. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay with that. Okay. I'm in. Because otherwise it's Ben-Hur. <laughs> uh, which, you know, because the world was clamoring for a Ben-Hur remake. <sighs> you, know what, you know what I have to say to Ben-Hur? Ben-Hur? I hardly know her! <laughs> God damn it, Mike. That was a stretch. That was, a stretch. <laughs> that was, that was pretty good, I thought. I like it. <laughs> I like it. Uh, and you can check out our next Complete Works, uh, where we'll be talking Trapped in Paradise. Uh, Shrek case- 5. Oh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. If Nicolas Cage is in Shrek 5. <laughs> Directed by David Fincher. <laughs> <laughs> Nicolas Cage and Brad Pitt are Shrek and Donkey. I'm in. In David Fincher's <laughs> Shrek 5. <laughs> Uh, and the S is the five, like the seven. Oh my god! <laughs> uh, we'll be talking about Trapped in Paradise, which is a Christmas comedy starring Nicolas Cage, John Lovitz, and Dana Carvey. That the crew of that film referred to as Trapped in Shit while they were making it. So good That's times. Look, you know. Good times to look forward to there. I think I'm pretty excited about that one. Yeah. Uh, all right, guys. Thank you so much for listening to the film podcast. We are out. Pistol on my waist, I might make a mistake. Headshot, headshot. Oh my God, am I crazy? Drugs every corner. This is Gotham City. Kill a prop, can't even kidnap you to cut out your kidney. Ain't no mercy. Got that purple Lamborghini lurking.